Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. I'm Laurent Pions, the CEO of the Monaco Mediax parent company of the Monte Carlo Television Festival. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Betting on International Co-Predictions, the Path Forward, a collaboration of the PGA and the Monte Carlo Television Festival. While international television co-productions are some 50 years old, they are now more prevalent than ever, helping to feed the increased demand for global content. This conversation is an examination of what's working in the space now and how it will evolve in the years ahead. I hope you will enjoy and learn from the conversation. As we close the book on 2020, a year in which we all have sacrificed so much, I'm filled with hope for 2021. I invite you to commune with the international television industry of the sunny shores of Monaco, June 18th to the 22nd for the 60th Monte Carlo Television Festival. But first, let me introduce my good friend, Vance Van Petten, the National Executive Director and COO of the PGA. Take it away, Vance. Thank you. Good evening, Laurent. My good friend of many, many years. Um, you know, many of my members don't know is that the Monte Carlo Television Festival was the first organization to recognize the Guild's vetting procedures for producers and eligibility for awards. And they've been a very good partner of the Guild for literally many, many, many years. So thank you, Laurent. Um, and good afternoon to our PGA members on the East Coast and good morning to our members here on the West Coast with me. I'm so happy to welcome everyone to this webinar of international proportions. I'm Vance Van Petten, National Executive Director and COO of the Producers Guild of America. And while I'd love to introduce all of our illustrious panelists, I'm going to focus solely on introducing our hand-picked moderator of today's webinar, Cynthia Littleton. Cynthia Littleton is co-editor-in-chief of Variety. She's been with that venerable entertainment news brand since 2007. She is truly a, what we'll call a veteran television reporter. Hopefully you've read her recent deep dive into CAA and the cross currents roiling the talent agency business or her ongoing analyses of the new business models being forged with every new technological advancement streaming our way. Frankly, whenever the Guild faces challenging issues concerning television, we call Cynthia. And that's why we are so happy to have her here today as our moderator. Cynthia, I take it away. Thank you, Vance, for that kind introduction. And I just wanted to say, I always, always love doing PGA events because it is truly a great organization of working people, people with drive and dreams. And there's nothing better. There's, you know, that's where it all starts in Hollywood. So I'm always honored. Thank you for, thank you for having me. We have a terrific panel here today of, of true industry veterans who know this subject inside and out. And so without much ado, we have, um, I just wanna introduce the panel and, and we will get talking about a very dynamic area of our industry. Um, just to start to go down the list here, we have Rola Bauer, president of International Television Productions for MGM. She is coming to us from Munich. Uh, after Rola, we have Gareth Neem, Executive Chairman of Carnival Films, who is coming to us from a lovely home in central London. Uh, after Gareth, we have Jane Root, Founder and Chief Executive Producer of Newtopia, a very busy unscripted banner, who is in Washington, D.C. And last but definitely not least, Christian Vesper, President of Global Drama for Fremantle, who is, if I was paying attention earlier, Christian is also in London, correct? Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Great, well, thank you all for joining us. Um, as Vance said, this is international co-productions. The international television business overall is exploding and co-productions, which have been a big driver in this area for a long time, have been, have been 
much more in demand, but also changing quite a bit in terms of the terms and how they how they come together, how how the how the sausage is made through international co-production. So this is a very timely topic. Of course, there is nothing more pressing for any producer on the planet right now than dealing with how to produce, how to get content produced in a pandemic, in a COVID-19 environment. But I thought I would like to start with this group, start by, let's talk about what the sort of the market dynamic was. What was the demand like and the opportunity to assemble kind of classic international co-productions? What, what did you sense the market was like just before the pandemic hit? So like take your minds back to January of 2020. My sense from talking to people that it was a bit of the Wild West, but also a ton of true opportunity because so much demand. Would anybody like to just kind of comment on what it was like just before the curtain came down in March? Well, it was interesting in one way. There was a huge amount of opportunity, but there was also the biggest new entrance in the streamers were pretty much holding on to everything themselves. And they were like, you know, the, so the huge new opportunities, but they were very much having a vision of, we want, we want everything. We want the world, at least in my bit of the forest. And I don't want to jump ahead to the post COVID world, but for me, that's the biggest thing that's changed. And so I think just before COVID, for me anyway, in my world, enormous opportunity, but it was hard to see that with those new entrants where the co-production opportunities were. Yeah, I, I think that, yeah. that, that from, from my perspective is, you know, we have companies globally uh, that we're trying to set up co-productions with. And I think that there was a struggle always, it's never easy. It's always like pushing a boulder up the hill um, to find the right partners. But, you know, sort of echoing what Jane is saying, uh, it has tightened. I think that what we saw during the last nine months was the continued consolidation um, into big global platforms and it was never easy, but it was a little bit more, it was a little bit clearer where, where, where you would land uh, certain co-productions. And I think it has gotten a little tougher um, over the course of the last nine months. And I don't know if that's COVID related or frankly, just the natural, where everything was trending in terms of, you know, obviously the, the, the Disney's and, and the Warner Media's clients of ours that, that are in a different place in terms of the rights that they're demanding. That that said, I think also at the same time we saw opportunity because people needed more more shows. Right, right. Those con confluence of events there. Uh, Roller, Gareth, any any just basic thoughts on kind of what 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 you were facing before we really got into the teeth of the pandemic? I mean, it's it feels like a different life, doesn't it, uh, January? But I, 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 my memory of it is yes, incredibly dynamic lots of opportunity, lots of uh, ideas being constantly pitched, but also, and, and this came to an abrupt halt in, in February, but a sense that although there's a lot of material uh, moving around and, and an insatiable demand, a sense that the big platforms were, of course, were quietly, perhaps not so quietly, growing their business affairs departments, their creative departments, their global presence. And for those of us who are associated in a more traditional production model, you know, back with Brother and I uh, and others who, who are with the more traditional studios, um, it clearly is a, um, there's a sort of phony war that's going on that, and, the, and the tectonic plates are moving in this industry. Uh, and of course that's all changed because of the practical problems of COVID, but things were moving massively anyway. And it will be interesting to see when we come through the other end and when, the, and when we've all been vaccinated and all of that, you know, like any war, and I see 2020, as, you know, the COVID thing, it's going to advance as, as, as only a war does. You know, we're going to move on five years quicker than we would otherwise have happened. So it's going to be very interesting to see where we land come spring of next year. I have an interesting, I, I completely agree with what my colleagues have said. I, I do, however, see one thing that has happened. Because of the streamers being here, a lot of the traditional platforms that are out there, that independent SVOD platforms, pay TV platforms, networks, they still, like Gareth said, they still need programming, like Christian was talking about, and Jane, whether it's unscripted or scripted. 
So what I saw in last end of last year, beginning of this year, was that demand. And I only know co-productions. I don't, I don't even know what I would do. I think if I got 100% from a streamer, <laughs> I'd probably be in shock. I'd probably go find another co-producer. <laughs> <laughs> Just out of habit, right? <laughs> um, and I think what I, what I do feel is part of the challenge that we were having and seeing streamers come into the marketplace was that we did, and Garrett's right, we did see that they were getting all of their studios built up internally. However, because they were there, and because the others who've traditionally been there needing their own originals, I did see that we were getting a lot done before COVID and um, placing them on both sides of the pond, working with the basic structure of a co-production and having the ability to do many of them with the different, um, at the time I was at Studio Canal and finishing up my eight year contract. And we had five different production companies, all busy, all busy working nonstop on co-productions. Now, and I'm now I'm jumping, but may I Cynthia, since I'm the last, <laughs> so I'll of do course. this way and then pass it back to Gareth and the others. <laughs> um, I would say that now I actually see in talking and I've only been six months in this position and I love the fact that MPM has given me the ability as a studio head to stay in Europe and be able to, because I'm not having that slightly arrogant approach of saying, oh, call me at four o'clock in the afternoon your time because I'm only getting up then because <laughs> uh, I'm in LA. Um, I love the fact that we're doing it out of here and we actually, Again, we're seeing because programming and originals are a need and because not everyone can carry the full freight of the financing, there is even more of a need I'm seeing from the different players who are non-streaming players. And the streamers, of course they need, but like Gareth mentioned, sometimes they wanna work with the studios, depends on the creator, but they're not hungry or eager to work with the studios. Do you think that is has the advancement of streaming and the the competitive pressure that the that the ad you know the the literal advance of Netflix and Amazon into into Europe into having you know feet on the ground developing their own content has that made it more challenging to do a traditional co-production where you have a big broadcaster from a couple of major Western European territories put some money together into something that can tra that can travel well. Is that is that traditional classic kind of co-production piecing piecing a couple of partners together to afford something that no one of them could do on their own? Is that under pressure because there's so much money and so many so much pull in the market from the big streamers with their big checkbooks? We're kind of finding the Right now, in the midst of the weird COVID world, we're kind of finding the opposite, oddly enough, with some of the, we're working for three different big streamers at the moment, and no, four, four, and some of them who previously, everything had to be completely owned by them are suddenly not, and that's because they're in a huge rush to get content, and they're like, you know, we want more and more content, and they're prepared, and so when I heard about you inviting me to be on this panel, I thought that's a really interesting moment because a few years back, we were in a situation where most of what we were making was 100% funded and that's now changed. And that there's actually people who previously insisted on 100% funding are now like, we want more and more and more content. Mm -hmm. And that's led to opportunities. So it's kind of paradoxical, but the intensity of competition is actually opening things up. I can see Gareth, you nodding. The, well, I, I, mean, I think that's very interesting, and I think the, the demand suggests that you know there is a huge advantage again in this this COVID year. The practicalities of production are such a huge obstacle. If you can license from another producer who's going to take care of all of that, uh, and and you know um, you haven't got the capacity within within your, within your own fledgling studio, but you want to go out to third parties, uh, you know I can absolutely see why that's happening right now. But I still think certainly for from a scripted perspective, I think that journey is still 
really is very much going the other way, that they're op massively open for business with producers, but they do want to own everything for, for, for obvious reasons. And I think those traditional, uh, uh, you asked the question directly to, to Rola, and actually she was the right person to ask because Rola is the person I remember when I was an executive at the BBC working with Jane 20 years ago. Rola was the only person out there doing this kind of thing then. Hey, hey, cut out the years, stop. <laughs> Another thing that... Only 10 years, actually. it really was that long ago, Rola. <laughs> you know, that model of going around and piecing things together, it, it, um, there are other ways to do it now. There are people who write the whole check, but they, they want everything for their money. I think that it, it, it's, you know, there is a, a capacity issue still, you know, with, with the big platforms building their capacity. And I think that there continues to be opportunities for our producers on that front. And I think that the working out of Europe, what's been interesting is we can make projects at a different price point. And that keeps certain opportunities open, even with the big consolidations in the US, you know, I've had various uh, commissioners in the US say, look, if you can, you know, I can still do this co-production if you get it in for under a certain amount of say a million dollars US, it becomes a different conversation for them. You know, they don't have to necessarily elevate it to a certain level where, the, where they're gonna get the pushback saying, no, we need to own this. I think, you know, and the other tactic is and I've seen this and I, as, it, as the platforms have rolled out through Europe, producing with them is different than producing with the studio or with the traditional network um, or, or, or a, um, you know, a, a state platform because, you know, it's a different level of experience, different types of executives, different expectations. And I think that producers, especially producers with a lot of experience, um, you know, will make that decision over how they want to work. And then that gives um, that gives you a little bit of leverage, to be perfectly honest, because, I mean, we consider our producers our, our talent, and talented producers can be a little bit more demanding about the structure of, of how their shows are rolled out. Mm -hmm. that, that's, a, that, that's actually a very interesting point, that the adjustment of, how, of expectations and how a show will be marketed and handled and what the, what the, what the plan is for shows, it's certainly something that... that, that the entire industry is dealing with in terms of how, of how things are rolled out and how, you know, how um, just how marketing plans and how, how you get, how, how you're able to get behind something or conversely feel like you might be one of 10 shows that might drop on a day. And if you don't, and if you don't get lucky. Um, the, in, the last... in the future though, because I like this producer of talent. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let that one go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but really, I mean, I think that it, it's, 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 it's part of the arsenal, you know, and 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 it's it, it it's good producers make better shows than bad producers, or or you know, I, I think. <laughs> are you finding with the big streamers that all roads are still, you know, mostly roads to commissions and green lights mostly flow through L.A. or New York, or are you finding that there are real kind of decision making capacities in London, in Germany, in in France now for some of the bigger players. We're finding okay. London and my experience, there the are huge organizations have been set up here um, and with, with very real uh, buying, commissioning, creative power. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, that's what we're finding. I mean, we're, we're having a big discussion with a, a streamer based in Italy at the moment, you know, and they very much have a lot of power. Uh, I feel like it's taken some time for all of the streamers to get their people into place. And now it's actually, yeah. they are actually able to execute out of Europe and it's, it's, it, which has been helpful. I think it, it, it's made the process much easier. And that's got to change the complexion of what they're interested in, of just the, of the demand of the types of material and, the, and even talent that they're willing to, to take a gamble on. Well, that's yeah. been the really exciting thing about the last 10 years, hasn't it? I mean, it really, that streamers or not streamers, it's just the appetite for global content. That's just been an extremely, I mean, for those of us who have been around for a few decades, right, brother, mm -hmm. you know, we used to always being the European in the room with no real interest. I mean, before, um, you know, for five years ago, you couldn't watch British content in the US. You really couldn't watch the kind of dramas I produce on PBS. 
and some of the great factual pieces on, on equivalent um, you know, cable. But you, you bet you couldn't watch the great British comedies and the mainstream British dramas or anything. And that, you know, that all that all changed about five, no, what, seven, eight years ago now. Um, and that's been the really exciting thing of this last decade and, and, and working in it. And why international is such, you know, it's not just Rola banging on the door like she was doing and saying this can be done. It, it really is mainstream now. Very, very when, much so. Very much so. And sorry to cut in, Cynthia. I just wanted to say the exciting thing to touch on what Gareth is talking about. I always say that we do foreign language as well as big English language. And I define foreign language by French, Spanish, German, and British, because it has a vernacular onto its own. And we never saw it for so many years other than in England. And then there was the anomaly. I mean, even when I was a buyer at Post Even, I had one series from England and everything else was American, American. I mean, we barely, and now you see in Germany, so many different British shows, but we're also looking to do the local shows and to come back to your question about the streamers they're empowered as well to push through these local shows. And that's quite exciting to be involved with that. So they've connected us. There's so many positive things about the streamers coming into the market. They've connected all of us internationally. We have started our own language, our own lexicon. And even if I found myself the other day watching a really cool new series. I don't know if I should be plugging anything here that none of us have actually produced, but a wonderful Spanish series. And I didn't want to watch it with subtitles. And, I, and normally I like to see the original. I understand a little bit of Spanish. I just said, oh, I'm tired. I'll watch it with, in English. And it was enjoyable, entertaining, is as good as any top, double the budget television series you see today because you didn't need to have that big huge budget it was emotionally engaging well and i think with the streamers you know what has continued to keep certain co-production opportunities open is as they expand into the local markets and are trying to produce local for local we have noticed with various of our producers um where you know they they, they need certain shows for certain territories and aren't willing to necessarily foot the whole bill because they don't see a life for it on their platform internationally. And it's, that has been an opportunity that we didn't quite expect um, and has kept the model moving forward. Christian, and in that case, do you, do you get some flexibility to take it and sell it in other markets? Yeah. Or so that yeah, no, sense. and that it, it, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, which of course, again, obviously distribution is a huge part of our, our business. So it is important for us to search for those opportunities. And, and again, I think that, you know, we've all been doing this long enough and there have been multiple times over the past number of years where there's been this push for vertical integration and it always looks like it's the end. And then of course, there are just so many exceptions to what people need and how they need to work. And I feel like that's one of them that we hadn't quite anticipated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jane, you were going to say? Well, it's in, in the last Two weeks, I've been had a series of meetings with the BBC about a couple of uh, different projects. And it's been very interesting to me to see the organization that me and Gareth used to work for, which was so focused on a schedule and slots for particular audiences. And also we were proudly kind of like, we were the BBC, we didn't need anybody, <laughs> you know, occasionally except for HBO, but we really were very certain. And now that, you know, times have changed and actually it felt like the whole conversation was different and that there was a sense that they hadn't, not as much money as they might, but they're having to figure out a sense of, of partnerships, which felt like, a, it felt very different. It felt like a new kind of beginning. Uh, but it's also that sense of leaving the schedule behind. I mean, I had, there was one pivotal moment for me. I was walking out of a Netflix meeting. It was like the second or third meeting We'd just done a deal on a big 10 part series and uh, the commissioner said, I was standing up to leave the room and he said, you know, we're paying for 10 hours, but, you know, try not to make it shorter than about 45, longer than about an hour and 10 minutes. And I, it was like, 
my life at the BBC where I was like, could you possibly take 30 seconds out of that? Or my life at Discovery where can we squeeze in a like three and a half minute ad break? I felt like, wow. <laughs> it, and that sense of openness was just really exciting. You know, really crazy. Oh, for, as producers, I can, I can only imagine. Um, let, let's talk specifically now about how, how much harder a very difficult job has become with all of the restrictions, with all of with the public health crises and the, and the pandemic, let me start by asking you where you are now and where what where you think you're going to be able what you think you're going to be able to do so, for say the first quarter of 2021. Like like how ambitiously are you forecasting for something like business as usual in terms of what you know what you need to shoot. Can you give us a sense of like how disrupted things still are for your slates? Um, Gareth? Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty busy actually. And, and um, although I'm here in London, I have two shows shooting, one in New York and one in Budapest. Um, and obviously from a practical level, that's fairly difficult. I've been in New York um, for several weeks for the start of production, but having come back to London now, of course, I can't really get back there. Things have got rather worse. Right. And just from a selfish point of view, there had to be a sort of, you know, with or without passports, visas, and everything else, you still need a dispensation to get in if you're a foreign national. That's very challenging. It means quarantining when you get there, coming back to London, quarantining again, which was 14 days for me here in London after that. And, um, uh, so I, I feel it's like we are shooting through. I mean, obviously nothing was shooting through the summer when nobody really knew what was going on. And I was very fortunate that I was not one of those people who had three shows halfway through production and nobody knowing quite how they could finish, which I, I, I really felt for colleagues who were in that position. Some people had a week left to shoot. You know, they had 30 weeks of production and one week to go. I think it was pretty cruel. We were days away from shooting... Um, uh, Gilded Age in, in New York, we were four days from production, I think. But I'd rather that than we were two weeks in and then we stopped. Yeah. We got up and running in September and, and The Last Kingdom is shooting again in Budapest, started shooting a couple of weeks ago. And we're just, you know, the same as everyone, we've got a whole new department that never existed a year ago called the COVID department. Um, I jokingly said uh, I should have studied epidemiology at university because I always wanted to be a producer. Um, and we're just sort of getting through it um, and, and spending large amounts of money on testing everyone day in, day out, crippling extra, uh, uh, a bit like on our governments, really, crippling costs that nobody ever thought were affordable on a national state level. Also apply to what they were lines and budgets that would have been totally unaffordable that we're all now carrying. Um, and Gareth, may I ask? On. Who's footing that bill? Is that bill coming? Is that bill being built into the license fee? Is the producer having to shake the couch cushions? How are you? Who's footing all the COVID and the PPE and all of those well, unexpected uh, needs? My own experience is um, it really depends on what the ownership of that show is and, and what, where the vested interest is. And it's either anywhere between 100% or it's a split of the cost between, between you know, if the producer is the owner you know, in your licensing, there's, there's, there's usually split costs. And it really depends on the, I imagine, the individual show. But that's just my experience. We, we carried on shooting even right through the summer. We did a huge shoot with a global top five movie star in Iceland. We did another one in Australia, uh, which was like two weeks quarantine in, two weeks quarantine out. There were people going crazy in their little hotel rooms in Sydney. And we're shooting... Today, I just was shooting in th three different shows uh, today, but it's hard. You know, it's like every day there's a new thing. Like you can't, you know, shooting in California suddenly today is really difficult. There's a whole thing. There was a rule about we were supposed to be shooting in a hospital. And did we have the co-production completely signed up with the British broadcaster? Unless we had that, we couldn't film in an NHS facility and we got that sorted out hours before we were supposed to start shooting all of those things and we set up a mobile lab for uh covid testing in iceland in a hotel basement and we were doing 200 tests every three days it was you know huge a huge undertaking 
uh, and just what you have to do. But yeah, none of us expected this. None of us did. I mean, wow. it's, it, it, it's been really impressive to me how our producers who are all frankly hustlers, you know, in the best sense, uh, you know, it, 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 it kicked everyone for a minute. And I think I, we, out of, I think we had 42 shows in production when this started and about 95% of them have delivered, um, which, you know, is a test in look at, you know, we're in the position of shooting in, in various territories. So certain territories had different protocols and different costs and, and different government support, you know, it's very, it has been very territory and show specific our experiences, but we are on track to deliver more shows this year than last, <clears throat> which I think is something that we wouldn't have expected in March. Um, you know, but, you know, to, 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 to everyone else's point as well, it is, it's hard. And I think that right now we are, we do struggle on certain of our productions when we're trying to lock the financing about where that last bit of, you know, COVID cost comes from. And if, if in certain territories, it can be up to 20%, which is really, I mean, that's only happened a few times, but it's a huge amount of money. And, and then at this point, I mean, it's a, we're in this strange position of, okay, we will budget this. We really have to, um, you know, hoping that if we, if, if by spring, we won't have to actually absorb those costs. It's a, Excellent. it's just a lot of discussion and confusion. You can't plan very well. And does the buck in terms of the public health aspect of it, I got to believe that's a whole nother level of agita for you as a producer being kind of, you know, being one of the people responsible for this public health does the, um, you know, does the organization of all that, creating the lab, doing the tests, does that really fall to the producer, to the exec producers or the, or the showrunners? Like who takes ownership of that on a production? I would imagine it's the producers. We did, we had to. Yeah, you, our producers so too, yeah. you, you wanna work with the risk assessment departments of whoever you're working for and you have to keep everybody informed all the time. And like, you know, this week, a lot of conversations about what's happening in California. But um, in the end, you know, you've got you, you've got to be there. Like, is everybody safe who's on set today? Is everybody, you know, can we plan for doing that? How, you know, right down to how do we, how, how do you film this sequence if you know your DP has to be six foot away from your star? And you know, a lot of micro. It's always the same, isn't it? It's a ten thousand tiny decisions, and now it's like twenty five thousand tiny decisions. But I think the, the, the studios um, behind us and financing projects have had, you know, they have established great uh, protocols during the summer with, I think when we should do the shout out to the unions actually, because they have really uh, worked and collaborated, you know, very closely. And it, it does feel like it's everyone sort of shared this problem together to find a, a working solution. And I find on a complicated uh, drama set, we are so adaptable, human beings are so adaptable, crews are so adaptable. For the first day on set with a mask, I just didn't know how we would get through the day. It's so uncomfortable and stifling. And actually, by the end of the first week, you're completely used to it. Mm. And, I, and I think to Gareth's point, the protocols are the most important part of just setting the guidelines for everyone. Um, I started in this position in June. So I was in looking at the slate that I was um, inheriting, but also looking at the things I wanted to get up and running. And we are budgeting a 10 to 15%. Um, there are a couple of them where we think we need to go up to 20, but we're doing this now with the knowledge that next year is we're closing the financing on a few of them with the plan to be in production in May, June, July, you know, but nothing before May. We have already set that. So we know the parameters, we know the protocols, and we have put that 10 maximum 20% on top within the budget. Whether like Chris said, we have a windfall, great. We'll spend it on other reasons or there'll be more profit later, <laughs> but it's in that budget right now. But 15 to 20%, that's not an insignificant amount. So that, that definitely gives- We have one think... where it's 30. Wow. 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 So that's filming all over the world and 
huge, but it, yeah, 30. That's not it. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think everybody is eagerly, eagerly consuming the uh, news of the vaccine deployments, probably no more so than people with, people with um, broad slates. Do you think that, of course, one of the drivers of co classic drivers of international co-productions were, were production tax incentives, tax incentives, production credits. Do you think that the pandemic times will accelerate changes there? In the U.S., there is definitely a feeling that some of the bloom is off the rose of tax incentives. We, you see a lot of states that had been very generous have been starting to reconsider some I know there's an endless debate about what a dollar of production generates in terms of in terms of revenue, but just from your experience on the ground, do you have any sense that that tax credits, whether pre or post pandemic, are something that are are still going to be very vibrant in Europe and other major territories, or is there a political, you know, are the winds shifting on that? We've had. Um... You know, there are a number of European, uh, in particular, uh, some of the Southern European territories where we shoot a lot, the, the tax incentives have increased um, and, and really in, in a way that they've accomplished exactly what that was meant to do, where it's really forced our decision making in a good way. I, 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 with the exception of America, I feel like that is something that um, will continue to be a, an attraction for us. and. I don't necessarily see that they're going to be um, cut back immediately once people have to start paying off the costs that, that were incurred during the, the crisis. But I think that, you know, that's a bigger political discussion that I'm not quite, it's hard to predict, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. You know, that individual states will, 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 when we come out of this crisis, will decide if it's going to be about spending less in order to, to cut costs to pay down the, the debt that nations have taken on with COVID or they're going to spend their way out of the crisis and individual yeah. nations will decide. But we as producers will simply move to whichever state yeah. we have. I mean, I, I, none of the shows I've ever made and certainly, you know, in the last uh, decade would ever have happened without these very effective, generous um, incentives in countries which have increasingly uh, improved their film capacity and the caliber of the crews working there. And, you know, I would say to, to the, the representative of, representatives of countries is just keep that incentive up, keep it up. That's why we, if, if it goes down, then you there. you just pull, pull out that even the next season you do somewhere else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, a, that's also a testament to just how mobile the, the both mobile people and, and facilities, but also the just how the infrastructure that has been developed by these programs to 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 seed local infrastructure in places that you know you know if you told people in Hollywood that North Carolina would be a filming hotspot 25 years ago they you know 30 years ago they would have laughed and now and you know and and it did become um so I think that the idea that you can't, you know, the idea that that you can actually relocate a show to Australia, you know, Vancouver or Australia, if if the incentive is right, is a testament to to all of that work that has been done. And um, it, it sounds like it's, you know, especially it sounds especially with COVID costs rising, it sounds like that incentive is going to be more of a lure and a magnet than ever before. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we've always enjoyed shooting in Europe. Uh, Africa, South Africa, so, and all those incentives are there, staying there. It's no indication that they're going to be dialing them back. Well, and I, and I think to Gareth's point, what's been great about them, you know, which, which has to be recognized is the creation of crews in places, you know, talented, effective crews outside of the, the, the US and the UK and in and, 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 and Western Europe. It's, it's, you know, we just did it, you know, we've done a number of shows in Morocco over the last couple of years. And, you know, I had one American buyer question constantly if we were spending enough money and, and, you know, because it, it, but then it looked great, you know, because the crews were really good and, you know, we weren't underpaying them. I mean, it was, it was, it was just, um, and I think it would be a, a shame for those governments to, to walk away from those businesses that have been created. We made one really expensive, complex show for a broadcaster several years ago and a senior executive at that company uh, watched a, a cut and 
they were terribly complimentary about it. And they said, it just goes to show, I forget how beautiful America is. This show was 98% shot in South Africa. And we said, yes, because we did the 10% just in case anybody ever said that. <laughs> we were like, yeah, it's so, I said, yeah, it's so exquisite. It's so wonderful. And they're like, yeah. And like, oh, America. It wouldn't have afforded this show without the South African rebates. <laughs> Oh my God, that that is so indicative of the global village in which we all live and, and in which you work. Um, speaking of the global village, we were talking just before the panel started. It, w one thing that also always stands out to me about this business, the entertainment business, the content business is as big as it gets, as many platforms as buyers, it's such a it's such a person to person. It's so about the connections that people have, a producer knows a writer, a, a director knows that a writer has long been fascinated by this subject. It's so much about, it's not something that can be put together, forgive me, by an algorithm. And you all, just even on this panel, you all have connections. You work together on various projects. You've worked together at the BBC uh, at different times um, and, and undoubtedly other, other platforms. You've collaborated on projects in, in different capacities. Can you talk about, you know, even the international, even though the international community outside the U.S. is so big and so many buyers about what it sort of working in international TV, that it is kind of a, that close knit world of producers and financiers and and uh, things that sort of make it kind of a community, even though it is spread around the globe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that. I love the fact that it is so intimate and so global because it allows us to find out about each other's history and language and what we're looking for. And yet you run into the same people all the time. What the streamers actually, to come back to one other, you know, because we sometimes criticize the streamers a lot, they actually brought in a, a lot of completely new, they took risks with completely new younger people. And that was great to see. So, and I'm talking on the script level, the writer level, the taking the risk on new voices that we may not have met or, because those people also took a chance and started talking a little bit more, a little bit louder. And that's uh, an excellent thing. But I mean, I've been chasing Gareth for years, trying to work with him. Of course, it was impossible because of where he was. And, but, and Christian and I had the pleasure of working together. And it was wonderful because we were putting something together from Europe that landed in the US when he was running a network. And it, he had the, and I thank him for that. He had the foresight to see that this was something that even if it was global and European, was going to transcend the boundary and work in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, I think that th those those days were were interesting in that I I was at Sundance Channel, and frankly, we didn't have the money to do much of our own originals. And at the time, it was really before Netflix got into the side of the business. It was it was how we were able to have ambition, and I and I think that that you know, and it was something that I think uh, uh, people still do. I mean, you talked about BBC beforehand and I, I still think, you know, BBC is one of the gold standard broadcasters in terms of their taste and and their in, the value of their imprimatur. And, you know, they uh, uh, they can't just pay full freight for everything. I mean, we all know the state of, of, of state broadcasters and that's important that we all in this side of the business, I think support you know the ability of a BBC to to continue to 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 achieve their 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 goals, and I think that again that speaks to the the value continuing value of of co production. But, but Christian, when you were at Sundance, I think that you were involved in bringing the Staircase to the US. Yes, that was a long time ago. Yeah, it's just an amazing show, which I think is one of those great great projects in a in a genre which has since exploded but that sense that at that time the fact that you were going to do a multi-hour kind of crime story yeah. of a single french family kind of felt very surprising to american audiences and yeah. yet it's symbolic i think of how far we've come that something like that you absolutely 
can see that. In fact, Netflix have gone off and done a, I think, a further hour. Um, they did. Yeah. And so that fluidity, I mean, for me, in all different kind of ways, is it is it that's a the result of the kind of interconnectivity that Cynthia is talking about, the fact that people know each other. Uh, and it's now just on a much bigger scale. When I first moved to America 15 years ago, it felt like, wow, this was this really big trip. And that it was kind of crazy to be running a company. And 10 years ago, when I started Utopia, it was crazy to be running a company in London, and yet I was staying here. But now it feels kind of like, yeah, and people do it all the time. It doesn't feel strange. You know, one thing, we're gonna get to um, audience questions here in a minute, but, um, one thing that we that I did want to touch on is how much also tonally the world has opened up when you see something like Fleabag coming and you know something so specific and something that seems so so British so you know so of that of that culture but yet exploded in popularity um, something like Chernobyl which was on paper who would who would want to watch a multi-part and multi-part narrative of, of what we all remember as a terrible event but the level of impact that that had that 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 storytelling had both on telling a russian story that had broad environmental implications but it was still very much a russian story and it just the, that that it touched so many people around the world that also is has got to be you know an as much of an just an exciting opening of of talent and content and the the ambition for for what is possible and Gareth, of course, you know, you're no, no stranger to sort of busting convention with, you know, who would have thought a costume drama on PBS would absolutely capture America and the world. Uh, hard to believe, but going on 10 years ago, it, it, uh, it seems like, and, and with, again, with, with so, many out, so many outlets now, not just the Netflix and Amazons, but local streamers, local, local content exploding, it just seems like it is for people with connections and a sense of really how the business works, this would seem like, despite the COVID, the overlay of the COVID, this would just seem like a renaissance time for people that know how to put things together and have great taste as you all individually have demonstrated. Yeah, <clears throat> like you were saying about, you know, what was it like back in January at the beginning of this, of this uh, session, and we were talking about uh, the, how things were changing so rapidly, but actually all of this, of course, started with the rise of home entertainment, streamers um you know we all remember you know as european producers we would take all those meetings in los angeles and people would say yeah but you only make six episodes <laughs> or you know you just use the same actor every time or we need to show you know and the the end and obviously i mean the the one part of the business that doesn't really ever get talked about in these things is is the huge hugely important u.s network television business which is still you know knocking out 22 episodes should, that's all. That's all. That's all ongoing. But in our sphere, I feel that the idea of a single writer, um, you know, writing an authored six or eight hour piece, which is what we've always done, and was really not really understood uh, by Hollywood at all, has now become the norm. And actually, when you have a successful show, um, it used to be the case that people would say, "Well, how long can you squeeze it out for? You know, how 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 long can how much longer can this keep going? We want you know we want ten seasons, but now it's the producer saying, well, we'd really like to do a third season. It's doing very well. And everyone's saying, no, we're on, we're moving on to the next thing. So I think a lot of the, <laughs> and Jane, you mentioned earlier on about the fact that we used to be slate. I used to sit there in table reads, timing things to make sure that my episodes roughly were going to end up the right duration, which is, we, as, as Jane said, you think about it, it seems ridiculous now. So those things, those things were changing. And, and, the, and the streamers have realized, of course, they'd much rather have a movie star doing four episodes and out you know, and have the star than worrying about 20 years of syndication of all those, you know, where we monetize things has, has changed. And, but that said, I do accept there is still a network television business that it has, that has its model. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and the connectivity of what you're both talking about is actually great from the story point of view. I, I cannot say the, um, you mentioned Chernobyl and Fleabag. They're such different, but <laughs> right. there. But emotionally, we were all so moved from 
the craziness of the dynamic of a young woman trying to survive today in the world of who am I, dating, my sexuality, everything that every woman goes through. And that's so exciting to have that vocalized and politically incorrect in how she did it. She was fantastic about that, very refreshing. And a lot of women could relate to it all over the world. So that was the, the you didn't need a brand of a book, you know, she just went for the emotion, <laughs> which was the connective tissue to all of us, I think, from and transcended all the boundaries. And the Chernobyl is a, an anomaly that I think people forget. We're so connected by disaster. Disaster, whether it's fire or, um, you know, all the, the, the elements of the earth, we are connected by that. And mm -hmm. if you recognize that and then you put in, and it was an emotional story. I mean, they made it very emotional in the way they entered into it. So, Rolla, you and, I, you and I worked with Johan on his first show. Exactly. Show. Yes. The last Panther. The director. The yeah. director of yeah. Chernobyl, yeah. Johan Strunk. Did Rank. I get it right? Rank. Johan Rank. 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 Sorry, not Strunk. Yeah, he was the director of Last Panthers, the one we were just talking about that Christian and I were involved in. So it's so <laughs> great to see him. Uh, yes, yeah. and that's what I actually was going to say, the connectivity of it. Everybody was, and he did the first couple of episodes, it's a Viking. So everybody was like, who, what? This, he's so young. But the fact he could handle the six episodes of Last Panthers also made the bigger players put more money in his hands and then he could do it. So it's a step-by-step -step building. And we well, all- It reminds me of this, and it is, It's a. It, I think the way it's been unfolding is it opens it up to a different kind of talent. And, and I, I think a lot about how I, I many years ago, uh, be, be, before Rolla, before 20 years ago, I was working in independent film and it's still sort of an independent film model on this, on the, uh, you know, there's an independence that you can create out of co-productions, which I think is exciting. You know, and, and it, it, it is, you are putting together financing almost like an independent film. Um, and it, it is, a, it creates an, an, it creates, I think, breathing room for certain types of thinking and certain types of, uh, of talent. And, and you know, and it, which I find incredible, I, I hope is valuable. I think it's very telling about the dynamic in the industry right now is that this, that this conversation hasn't been about oh my God, you bring three partners together and one person's whining about the casting and one person wants to not, you know, like it, it's the conversations is even with all the, the public health drama, the conversation is all about opportunity. I think that speaks volumes. We've got a couple questions here from the audience. One is very specific. Um, specifically, have you, have you needed specific insurance for COVID and how have you dealt with securing that and, and has that been your has have you had to secure special COVID insurance if you have if you have had to do so we've done it as ongoing part of the ongoing insurance we it, but it's really complex it's and lots of lots of exclusions but we, we had, I, I if there's very specific COVID insurance out there <laughs> that like can, then I'd love to hear about it but we I, I don't think I, I haven't, I don't know about it if there is. Okay, gotcha. Anybody else have any experience with insurance one way or another? I mean, it's, it's varied by territory for us, but you know, to Jane's point, it's, it's, it's very complicated, lots of exclusions. It has increased the risk for the studios. It's just inevitable. You know, if, if you're lucky if you're shooting somewhere where there's a lot of government backing. Government backing for for healthcare support? Yeah, well, or just for shutdowns and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, another, uh, another listener here is asking, um, can you name some specific countries that offer really generous incentives for production, for shooting? Belgium. Well, Belgium, yes. South Africa, a lot of Eastern European countries, I mean, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Britain. If you're yeah, a Brit hey, Britain, United Britain, Kingdom. Britain, United Kingdom. United Kingdom yeah. Yeah. We're about to start shooting in the Canaries just after the new year. Very open, huge, huge, huge uh, incentive. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, Belgium works, uh, uh, Brussels works amazingly well for Paris, so. Mm. Yeah, the tricks, the tricks you learn. Um, let me, let me go, our, our time is coming to an end. Let me just round Robin real quick. Tell us something, a project, a talent, a idea, something from your shop or your company that we should be looking out for in the new year or something that just something you're excited about. Give us, give us a flavor of something you're working on. There you go, Cynthia, you're reverting to type. You see, it's all in the same. Well, the one, that, the one that we, at the moment, it, it's on a streamer and it's, a, and it's uh, not fully funded by the streamer is the Calm, the World of Calm project, which is a crazy project connected with the app, uh, the mindfulness app. And that was like the idea that you can do a show, which is kind of basically designed to make you fall asleep before the end of it, was kind of so nuts. And talk about something which you could never, ever have sold to a, uh, a terrestrially based broadcaster. And it's selling throughout the world. And so World of Calm just shows how crazy you can make things in these crazy times for us anyway. That's awesome. Thank you, Jane. Christian? Yeah, we actually... Uh are going into production in the new year on a uh, mini series that we've done with Michael Winterbottom about the first five months of the Boris Johnson premiership. Uh, we've announced the show. We will be announcing cast and, and network soon, but it's, uh, it's, it's it, with Tim Shipman from the Times of London. It's, it's, the, it's, it's amazing. I mean, having lived through it all, and then you look back at it, the absurdity of every day of the last, you know, number of years, frankly, in, in England, it's, it's, it's really fun. Christian, I, want oh, to watch, I really want to see it right now. <laughs> yeah, no, the scripts are, it, 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 you, you laugh through the tears. <laughs> it's, it's very good. Oh, we will watch out for that. Rola, I know you are, are still in your infancy at MGM, but I, I also know you probably have five, 50 projects going by now. Well, we, I, I'm not allowed to go in and announce any of them. I will say that there are a number of them that I'm quite excited about were also working, developing, and putting together projects with a company that MGM owns, a sister company called Epix, uh, which is a platform, as you know, and that's very exciting because they're open to European narrative and have done very well. Um, Gareth, you know, one of them that was very successful for them that you had. And Gareth Belgravia is running uh, on, on, on Epics, the pay channel. Yeah, a, yeah. a, a really good yeah. costume I, drama. Um, I really echo you, Rose, because we had a fantastic experience working, working, working with Epics and, and Michael Wright. Well, oh, my God. Do I have witnesses that Gareth me may work with me? Do you have, <laughs> have a moment here? <laughs> Y'all heard it. Yeah. <laughs> All so right, great. I just say that um, there are some projects that we're going to be announcing European lens onto American narrative. And that's always interesting when you mix and match that combination. For sure. For sure. Gareth, I'm, I am, I was sorry to hear that for, you know, four days out, you were, that you were so close to Gilded Age. I've been, I've been very curiously watching this project and it's many incarnations over the years. Well, I'm sorry that we can't have you on the set, Cynthia, because as you know, no visitors are allowed on any sets now. But uh, all I can say is that show to see, um, you know, they've built the Upper East Side in, in Long Island and um, it, it really looks fantastic. So it's a very exciting project. Looking forward to that. But that's with Julian Fellows of Downton Abbey fame. Really looking forward to that. Well, thank you all so much. This has been a really, a really interesting hour talking about the, the ins and outs and the dynamics of, of the international television business, the co-production business. All of you have so much knowledge all right up here. Thank you so much for taking an hour to share it with us. And before I sign up, before we wrap up this PGA, um, this, this, this co-production itself, this panel is a co-production of the Producers Guild of America and the Monte Carlo Television Festival. And in the spirit of optimism, we want to encourage people to think about attending the Monte Carlo Festival June 18th through the 22nd in a beautiful spot in the world. And we're all just going to think positive and hope that we can, in fact, do it in person. Go vaccines. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. That was Thank great. You. Thanks. Bye-bye.